I was talking to some uh, fifth and sixth formers the other day, and they were all apparently wanted to be journalists. And so I went along and started talking to them. It was a Q&A thing, question and answer. And I said to them, you know, just fire away anything you like. And uh, I was very depressed because the first question was not, you know, how did you get into journalism or, you know, what sort of reporting did you want to be when you were really young? Did you want to be a foreign correspondent? What's the biggest story? Nothing like that. It was, what's the worst mistake you've ever made on television? (laughs) So I'll just get it out of the way. It was when I announced the closure of a porklift fuck factory (laughs) in uh, (laughs) Southampton. And it didn't do my career uh, much good at all. Um, but the second question, what depressed me, I think, even more, it was uh, a 16-year-old girl stood up and said, how do, you, do I become a presenter? And I said, look, you don't really want to be a presenter straight away. The best thing to do is to get a job on a local paper, be a reporter. best thing to do is to want to be a you know, foreign reporter, see the world, do real stories. You don't really want to be a presenter uh, straight away. And she said, uh, no, 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 all I want to do is be famous. I just want to be a presenter, she said. And and people sort of laughed at her candor. But actually, it was quite depressing because I think the best thing for a young journalist to do is go and be a journalist and learn the trade on a local paper or local radio and start that way. But all she wanted to do and all quite a lot of people want to do now is just be a television presenter. I get a lot of emails from people saying that's what I want to do, a presenter. So, I mean, I don't think that it's, the, um, it's necessarily the way to go. And it also suddenly dawned on me that these um, school kids in front of me were all utter liars. Because I said to them, how many of you watch the programme that I do? And they all put their hand up. 90% straight up. We watch news at 10. Now, I know they're lying. I mean, they knew they were lying. I knew they were lying. And I know they're lying because we've done a lot of research recently which says 12 to 18-year-olds don't watch an awful lot of what I call terrestrial television news, like, you know, the news on on 10 o'clock at night or 6 o'clock. They don't watch that. They get their news from somewhere else. And, I mean, our research actually states that of 12 to 18-year-olds says here, 50% now get their news from either Twitter or Facebook. 50%. And that is probably twice the number of 12 to 18-year-olds who read newspapers and about the same as those uh, getting news from radio or TV. So the headline is pretty clear, isn't it? Uh, The new generation is getting its news from the new media. New media is rapidly swallowing up people like me, uh, and the game is up, or very nearly up. But the big question is it, is it? And I think that we just need to stay calm and look at the facts. Now, um, I'm not going to embarrass myself by asking how many of you uh, watch news at 10, but I will ask you where you regularly get your news from. Um, because ITV again have done a poll, it's very interesting. So if I ask you who regularly gets their news from the radio, hands up who regularly gets their news from the radio. Uh, Who regularly gets their news from newspapers? Yeah, that's quite interesting, 20%. Who regularly gets their news from the internet? Yeah, you see, virtually 100%. And who regularly gets their news from TV? Be careful. (laughs) Uh, Right, well, that's very interesting because the figures nationally of all age groups, and not just your age, uh, is that newspapers, 44% say they get the news regularly from newspapers. That's declining. Uh, Radio is 32%, and that's holding pretty steady. Internet, whether it's via the laptop or via uh, the mobile, is 26% and rising very fast. Uh, Television news, still low wins hands down, Um, and 79% across all age groups, 79% of people still regularly use uh, television news as a principal source of news.
Uh, television news also comes way ahead when it comes to trust. This is quite interesting. Uh, which news source do people trust for fair and unbiased coverage? Uh, newspapers, 4%. Now, that was, these polls done you know, in the midst of the hacking uh, scandal. But newspapers, 4% is extremely low. The internet, 5% which again I think is low, but you can understand why. Radio is 9%. Um, and that's across the board, it's not just sort of BBC Radio, that's radio right across the board, 9% um, when it comes to trust. TV news is 74%. So 74% still trust TV news um, as their main source. So, um, and, but the point is, the point is, how long is that going to last? Uh, last? Have social networks such as Twitter and Facebook and citizen journalist, uh, journalism uh, and the, the kind of reporting that they've spawned, has that rendered mainstream journalism far less important? That is the big question that we face in, in, in mainstream journalism now. And I can see what people mean. Um, I can see how if pictures of a breaking story are, or, or a, you know, pictures of a breaking event, news event, are on Twitter in an instant, it can make our job at 10 o'clock at night seem less valuable. I can also see how if opinion or reaction or comment uh, on a story is running on Twitter almost immediately, which of course it is, uh, then that, you may feel, neutralizes what we do at 10 o'clock at night. Um, the trend is for news as it happens. Uh, in an instant, quick fire, fast, dramatic. And I understand that. We all understand that. Um, you know, we, we want to know more, more quickly. And of course we do through these uh, social networks. But, and it is a pretty big but, um, I believe that the spread of social networks like Twitter or Facebook <coughs> make what we do not less important, but more important. And I'll tell you why. Um, yes, news is and should be fast and dramatic and up to the minute, but it can also uh, be wrong. Uh, Twitter at its best is convenient, informative, a very useful tool. Uh, you can get reliable news feeds. Um, you can see what opinion formers have to say. You can get links to blogs and to columns. But at its worst, it is horrible. It's a horrible kind of mush of of rumour and innuendo and speculation. Um, sometimes it's misleading, sometimes deliberately misleading, um, and sometimes it's just downright lies. So more than ever, it is our job as trained journalists, and it will be your job as trained journalists, to wade through all that kind of mush and noise and that fog of information uh, and work out what is right, what is fact, and what is the real news. Um, our job at ITN and BBC and the mainstream television news is still to bear witness. It is to be there and see with our own eyes what is happening and tell the story as we see it. It is not just to accumulate all the stuff we're getting off mobile phones, useful though it could be, or off Twitter, or Facebook, or whatever, and sort of regurgitate that. And so we need to be there to bear witness as experienced journalists. It's about eyewitness reporting. It's still about analysis. Um, and it's about still the foreign correspondent who bears witness and bears testimony to what he sees, who is trusted by the audience, or becomes trusted over time uh, by the audience, and who delivers a you know, an unbiased or an impartial uh, version of events. And it is still, you know, bar what a lot of people say, it is still a noble concept of journalism, I think. I mean, there's also another perilous side to Twitter and to Facebook and all, all the other social media networks. Um, and you could see it recently, you can see it in the coverage of conflicts like Syria now. You know, what do you believe? What do you not believe? What is real? What is not real? Um, you know, there are very clever people out there who edit pictures to make them look like 
um, real pictures, edit pictures to make them look like they're at a certain place at a certain time when in fact they're not. You know, we've had pictures in to ITN that purport to be one thing, a massacre, say, in a, a village in Syria. And we're all thinking, well, we have to use this. This is important. This tells a story. We haven't got someone there to, to, to find out the truth for his or herself. Uh, so we need to use it. And then we tend to think, well, hang on a minute. How do we know it's, it's real? And what we often do is we will use it, but say there's no way that we can corroborate this. But it has happened. It didn't happen to us. But it has happened to a major network that they have used <coughs> pictures which turned out not only to be a different day or a different place, but turned out to be a completely different conflict. They were pictures taken during the Iraq conflict, I think I'm right in saying. So there you have you know, another problem. Um, you saw it e equally with the um, recent conflict over Gaza. And you had the Israeli Defense Force tweeting. You had Hamas on the other side tweeting. And what they say was obviously heavily, heavily influenced by who they were. It, it, it was their worldview. It was their version of events, um, which was neither impartial nor pretended to be. Uh, nor was it properly tested. So these are all the problems. The danger of Twitter to the mainstream media is, is evident. In, think, in fact, you could almost think of it as a, like a stream. And, you know, um, our news mainstream is now developing into lots of tiny little tributaries, if you like. So many sources now coming into this mainstream of news. And some of those sources are, f are clean and useful and pure and, and good water. And some other of those streams... Pardon? Sorry. Why? What's that? Oh, no, I'm used to what. Um, so <laughs> some of these other streams are, are you know, toxic and not clean water and full of ghastliness. So we need to find out, you know, what the source of those streams are and keep the mainstream pure, if you see what I'm saying. And it is startling how some established broadcasters and media companies are being badly affected by this and are not properly checking it. And there are some recent examples which you all know about, about um, how internet rumour has suddenly come into the mainstream and on a number of occasions, or at least a few occasions, was proved to be wrong. And that has a bad impact on what we do. Because the facts, ultimately, uh, facts are our stock in trade. That's what we do. That's what we deal in. Uh, they're all we have to go on. We, 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 we can't survive if what we're saying is wrong or, or untrue or even partly untrue. We won't survive very long if we peddle half-truths and, uh, and rumour. Uh, and if we're not careful, the new media world, in the new media world, facts and real hard facts will just sort of not really matter. They'll recede into the distance and speculation and, uh, will take over. So unless that is that we offer news that you can trust. And uh, so now more than ever is my message, I think. Now more than ever, what you are learning to do is more important than ever. And I just think that, bear it in mind, it is, Jon Snow said uh, the other day, he said that, we, you know, this is a golden age of broadcasting, and he's right. We've never had more information. We've never had more information reach us more easily. We've never had more people providing information. Everybody, I suppose, now with a mobile phone is, is a potential journalist. And we've never had more people training as journalists, proper journalists. And so we, it is a golden age in that respect, but it's also a dangerous age in the way we use all this, this stuff. And, um, and I think it's a, a really important message for you guys. I didn't have to worry about it when I was you know, on a 
a journalist training scheme. We didn't have to worry about Twitter and Facebook and all these other sources of it because they didn't exist. You know, we had a typewriter and we used to shoot on film when I started. That's how long ago it was. Um, but and in fact, it's, you know, I talk about how social media and everything has changed. Um, but technology, television technology itself has changed unbelievably. I mean, the way I worked as a foreign correspondent and the way I work as a presenter now has completely been transformed by technology. Uh, when I started, w the, the top foreign correspondents were traveling abroad, filming on film, then they were sending the film back by aeroplane, and then it was being processed and eventually edited, and then it would appear on screen a few days later. I mean, if you imagine that now, a major event happens, and you're sitting on the news. It happens on Monday, you're seeing it on the news on Thursday. That is the world that I started only for a year or two, mind you. It changed quite quickly after that. But, um, um, but now we can, go, we can go pretty much anywhere in the world and broadcast uh, live. I can, we've, we've done um, the evening news or news at 10 from uh, the Zimbabwe border. We've, done, we've even done programs, a whole week of programs from Antarctica. We just flew over with a dish, a satellite dish, within a few hours the dish was, was up and running and we could be broadcasting live from the middle of nowhere, and I mean the middle of nowhere. So the, the whole thing has changed and it means that, that our job is much easier uh, in some um, respects, but it also means that um, this ability to be live, broadcasting live in a kind of nanosecond, um, doesn't mean you should do it just because you can do it. Because one of the dangers, I think, of 24-hour of news, brilliant though it often is, um, is that there's now this kind of rush to get to somewhere set up and start talking. And so the journalism part of it may be you know, put into second place. Maybe the, the emphasis now is just getting on air. So it almost doesn't matter what you've got to say. You know, and then you have airtime filled with you know, speculation and there's a kind of vacuum of real information because you haven't had time to land and go and talk to the people who matter or go and talk to both sides about you know, get opposing views. You haven't got time to do anything like that. You've landed. Basically, what you've done probably is phone the office in London. They've told you what they're reading on the news wires and then you just repeat it back. And so, you know... the. the and that is a real problem. Um, on so many occasions, we have a breaking story where genuine information, it seems to me, is in, is in short supply. And, you know, we fill it with, with speculation and rumour. And uh, just we, we, we start um, um, talking about information which we can't verify. Uh, so, you know, there's a great saying in... 24-hour news that you're never wrong for long. So you can always put it right on 24-hour uh, news. Um, but that is, that is a real danger. But that's not to say that it's not Jon Snow's golden age. I agree with him that it is, uh, for so many of the reasons I've just explained. Um, but I think, you know, the point to make is that... Uh, Use the new technology and use the new social media to your advantage and to be wary of it and to not let it take over your lives. Because then TV journalism, if, if, you, if you want to end up as a foreign correspondent or you want to end up as a sports correspondent, which I did um, uh, in the early 80s, um, you know, it is a wonderful career. And, uh, you know, I was lucky enough to cover um, six Olympic Games and four or five different World Cups. Used to go on tour with the England cricket team and, you know, go to Wimbledon each year. And, you know, it's a, it was a tremendous life. But what I really wanted to do was be a foreign correspondent. So I used to make sure that when I went on overseas tours, the sports tours, that you would try and find new stories to do while you were there. 
and they were pretty grateful for that most of the time because they couldn't afford to send anybody. So as long as you were doing that, you uh, increased your chance of becoming a foreign correspondent, which I was lucky enough to do. Um, so you do get to do wonderful things and to meet wonderful people. In fact, I was just asked beforehand, you know, what is your greatest experience as a foreign correspondent? And I was saying it was to be in South Africa at the, um, at the end of apartheid when Mandela took over and on the day that they all voted and to go out and film, you know, 15 million black people voting for the first time in their lives and deciding who was going to be their president for the first time in their lives and just to film their faces and to see how they were reacting I was just a, a, you know, a, a, a fantastic privilege to be there. And then, of course, Mandela takes over and to cover what he was doing for the first two or three years of his presidency and interview him and talk to him, it was just a real privilege and an honour to, to do that job and to witness something as historical as that. I never thought for a moment that I would, uh, I would have the opportunity. And that was back in 1994. And, and it, so it's not all like that. You know, this was a very uplifting event and, and was wonderful. But within a, a, a month, I think it was, of, of um, Man Mandela being inaugurated, I was sent on the most depressing story of my life, which was the, um, the genocide in Rwanda which happened in the April and May of that year, or June of that year. And so going from a really uplifting story to within a month being sent to Rwanda, where four or 500,000 people were killed in a matter of a few weeks, you know, with machetes and, and the slaughtered, and children were slaughtered and had their limbs taken off. And the whole thing was very, very depressing indeed. I can't think that I will ever cover a more depressing story than that. So one minute you can be doing something amazingly uplifting and interesting and you know when you think you're lucky to be there the next moment you're doing something like cover a dreadful event uh, like that that happened in Rwanda. Um, not to say that I'm not glad I covered it because sort of retrospectively I'm glad I've covered events like that because someone needs to cover events like that and I think part of being a journalist part of being a foreign correspondent certainly is that you know you will get the opportunity to go and cover things that perhaps journalists in that country that you're going to are not able to do there may no, there may be no free press in the country where these things are taking place so the the domestic press is not going to cover it so it'll be down to you as a foreign correspondent to say well someone should be covering this and it's going to be me or it's going to be my organization and I think there are, you know, you, there are countless uh, examples and occasions when journalists from Britain have gone somewhere and, you know, held people to account in a country or, or, or risked their lives covering conflicts that just need to be covered. And, and I think that that is something that you, you know, when you embark on a career in broadcast journalism, need to think about. Is that something I want to do? Is that something I'm prepared to do? Is that something that uh, I think... Yeah, I would like my career to go in that direction because it is a reality that you will go to places like that. But it is all part and parcel of being a foreign correspondent. Um, so I think, you know, and I think back to when I was your age and I was working on a local paper, the Bournemouth Evening Echo, and I never thought for imagine that I would do, uh, never imagined for a moment that I would do anything like... Uh, like I, I, I went on to do and was allowed to do as a foreign correspondent. And, you know, I'm sure you're thinking, maybe thinking in a similar way that I can't imagine I'll get the opportunity to do that. You know, you look around you, how many other people may want to do exactly the same thing? And so it is competitive, it is difficult, but it can be done. It, I, didn't get, I didn't go to university at all. I didn't get a degree at all. And I did my A-levels and went straight onto a local paper and worked for two years on a local paper. And then was lucky enough to, to get a, a job on a paper in London and then joined the BBC when I was very young. I was about 21. I got a job in the BBC. Um, but it was much easier then. It was um, much easier. There wasn't the same level of competition there is now. So I do sympathise with you in that respect. But I don't sympathise with you in the, in the 
um, respect that it is possible to do. You can still do it. You're in a very good place to do it. Um, and if you really want to do it, it will happen. And the opportunities are still there. There are more television channels now than ever before. There are more news outlets than ever before. And it's just a question of, of you know, hard work, perseverance, and luck. So I think, I think my, I'll take some questions if you're interested. But I mean, I think the message is uh, certainly about the, this sort of new age of journalism is that the, use the, news, new, the new media for, um, for what it benefits, uh, for, what, you know, for the reasons that it benefits it. Don't let it displace or dislodge the real journalism, uh, the proper kind of fact-based journalism. It's unlikely to happen, I think, because traditional TV news and newspapers still play um, such an important role. Um, and I think, you know, the fact that so many people still have their faith in television news in the evenings, appointment to view television, is good news for journalism uh, in this country. Um, but I think, you know, television news still provides the window on the world that you can trust. It is, still has these arresting images and stories uh, with analysis, and it has this wide reach, which I've been talking about. New media, yes, is here to stay, um, but I think we just have to recognize that and take the best of it and reject the worst of it. We should let it help us, uh, not <coughs> allow it to kind of overrun us. So that's my message. Um, if you've got questions, I think we've got, we've got time to do some questions. Um, I was going to show a, a long tape about ITN, but maybe you prefer to ask a uh, question. Might be more useful. Because you all watch ITN every night anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, yeah, and I was just wondering about the kind of ethical dimension in terms of being a foreign correspondent somewhere like Rwanda. Like, how do you resolve things like being impartial, having non-bias, I mean, this kind of horrific stuff going around you. Well, it was pretty easy to be uh, uh, impartial in the Rwanda. It was pretty obvious what had happened. So um, um, it was very difficult to comprehend what had happened and to um, realise quite the scale of what was, what was happening at the time. Um, but there was no question then... You know, people say, how do you stay neutral? Well, there was no neutrality required then. You know, there was a very clear case of what was happening and what was good and what was bad. And, um, <clears throat> there, you know, there was, no, there was no real room for some moral ambiguity or anything. What made you want to have a career in journalism? Um, that's a very good question. I think when I started out, I just wanted to be a sports reporter, and I wanted to go and watch great sports events, and, you know, I probably about half of you. Um, and, um, but, but when my kind of thought process developed a bit about journalism, I just realised that I wanted to be a foreign correspondent. I wanted to go to places and report. I, I, it just, I knew quite early on in my life that that's when I was 15 or 16, and that's what I wanted to do. And, um, you know, I used to watch people on television at that time, like, you know, Brian Barron and, you know, Mike Nicholson and these great foreign correspondents, and I just thought that is what I would love to do, and that's, um, you know, the way I'd like to go. Uh, there was no one specific incident or one, you know, influence, which... Uh, it, but it, um, I, knew, I was lucky enough to know quite early on because I, my own son has no idea. He's 21, he has no idea what he wants to do now. And I think that's quite difficult. I've just said, look, take another couple of years, relax, don't worry. As long as when you do decide, it is something you really want to do, rather that than start something you don't want to do, and then chop and change for the next 10 years of your life. So he's gone to uh, Holland to work for a football club, <laughs> which is great. Yeah. A career change. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, though, my employers have quite often. Um, <laughs> um, no, not really. Do you know what? I, do you, I'll tell you something quite... I'll tell you an honest truth. I've got a couple of friends who... Um, <laughs> um, I've got a couple of friends who 
decided that they wanted to go and work in the city. And so off they went. And I've kept in touch with them. And um, one of them certainly now is making a huge amount of money, obscene amount of money in the city, doing very well. But I tell you this, I would never, ever change what I do and the satisfaction I get from what I do to go and work in the, the city for you know, large amounts of money or anything like that. Or, and I've never thought really about changing career. Um, you know, you, you've chosen a very good career and you're lucky to be where you are and you're lucky to be able to have the chance now to make the most of it. Yeah. Oh, all the time, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. quite hard for you to... Um, well, it's called, it's called um, uh, parachute journalism. So, and it happens quite often because we can't, obviously can't have bureaus in every country. Um, but the most satisfying form of journalism is, is to be... For instance, I was in South Africa for four or five years, and to be based there, that's the most satisfying because you get into the story, you get to understand people, you get to meet people. Say I was in Hong Kong for six years, so you get to, to know Asia and you go to China a lot. So that's the most satisfying kind of journalism. But the whole parachute thing, you do, ha it, there's a skill to it and there's an art to it, and that, that is to be able to sort of gen up on the flight. That is the key, to gen up on the flight. You've got a, sm you sh you, you know, you've got a smattering of knowledge about most things, but you can't pretend to be an expert. It is why... You know, in countries that you haven't visited before or, or in regions that you're not genned up on, it is why the most important person in your life is the local fixer or the local journalist who is working for you, you know, at the scene. And, you know, they're indispensable. Many is the time that I've landed somewhere and I've got a general idea of what's going on. But what you miss is this kind of minutiae and the nuances that's what you miss, and you don't really know, you know, the sort of inner politics of a situation. And that's what someone local can give you. But it, I, do, I don't mind confessing it is terrifying sometimes to pitch up somewhere and you're on air in three or four hours' time, you know, on News at 10 or the evening news, and you've got to do a piece, you know, maybe about a sort of, you know, what's been going And it is very difficult sometimes to sort of get a grasp on it um, early. But that's where these local journalists really help. And in fact, it's not a bad idea. One of the, my bits of advice I give to people who say, oh, well, I've been on local radio for a while, or I've been on, I can't get a job on national television, I can't get a job on national newspapers, but I want to travel, I want to go abroad. One of the great things to do, I think now, is to go somewhere and just gen up on it, live there for a couple of years if you can, quite cheaply, and then offer yourself to the national broadcasters or to the papers as a kind of local fixer. And then you can start when, so when they f send correspondence in, pick an area that you think where there's going to be a major news area in the future, or you can see something coming up. We've just got a guy gone to Brazil to work out of Brazil as a correspondent, because he knows in, you know, for the next five or six years, Brazil's going to be big news, the World Cup and uh, what have you, and the Olympics. So, um, that, that, that is a quite a good way to get in with the national papers and the national television stations by working for them as a fixer or, you know, it, it, but we rely on people like that quite, quite heavily. Um, I really enjoyed your real crime series. How much input do you have in, in that? Well, it, it differs from one story to another. I mean, we, um, we went through a year when we made 15 of them. Um, three years ago, I think it was, two or three years ago. And I can't, haven't got time to stay across all three of them. Sometimes you're required to do quite long interviews, and, and if there are main interviews to do, I would do those. But more often than not, it was the production teams who did most of the work. Because a lot of it was based around reconstruction, really good reconstructions that were done. Um, so I relied very heavily, I don't mind saying, on the, on the producers and the production teams of the various independent production companies who made those those, um, <coughs> those films. What's the most challenging thing you've had to face in your career? Like this. Um, <laughs> the most challenging thing. Um, it's a very good question. I think working, probably working in China was the most difficult, at a time when 
I mean, I was working in China or trying to work in China, maybe a better way of describing it, in the sort of early 90s when it was m very difficult to, to do proper, any sort of proper journalism in China. It's opened up a little bit now, not a lot. It's still you know, politically very difficult. But um, you, to, 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 to do any really meaningful journalism was very difficult. And the, the thing about China is was you saw stories everywhere. There were just stories everywhere, whether it was one-child policy or, what, you know, um, the terrible natural catastrophes that used to happen in a huge country and you wanted to get, you weren't allowed to travel. You needed permits for everything. You needed permits and permissions to speak to anybody. Uh, you were followed a lot of the time. You know, even to go and film, I remember we were trying to film on Tiananmen Square um, as Deng Xiaoping was the leader at the time, he was very sick and we knew there was some sort of, you know, something going to happen. So we went to film in Tiananmen Square and we got arrested and held for hours and it was just a very difficult place to work. And I mean, I think still is probably, but just not quite as difficult now. You can actually travel a bit now. And I think they understand. I also think now that China understands that, you know, the benefits to them of having international journalists there and allowing journalists to do more. But at that time, early on, it was quite a, quite a challenge to, to do what we wanted to do. Um, I was just wondering, sort of on a personal level, about being a foreign correspondent, how difficult it is sort of trying to balance it with family life and with you going so far away and it's just quite dangerous. Yeah, it is difficult. All my children were born abroad in some one country or another, so never, I say all, only three, but um, they, um, t two of them were born in Hong Kong and one was born in South Africa. Um, so we were traveling, you know, for sort of 15 years. Um, and my wife is a, is a casualty doctor, so she used to come and quite often get jobs in, so in South Africa she worked for a while in a township and, you know, so that did kind of work, but it's, it's a, it is a, a difficulty. You've got, to, you've got to both buy into the whole thing. Um, and then you've got, you know, issues where, about schooling and stuff with the kids and everything. And, you know, there comes a time in every foreign, most foreign correspondent's life when they, you know, quite like to head into the studio, become a presenter and stay at home. And that comes into the head of a lot of foreign correspondents' wives as well. But perhaps, <laughs> perhaps, perhaps you should uh, just... So, I mean, I've travelled a lot. When I was 31 or 32, I've still got my passport. I travelled for seven and a half months of one year. I was away from home. I mean, that's kind of, you know, sort of armed forces stuff, isn't it? You're away for... But I was away. We, we worked it out. So it is, you know... It, um, but that was in Asia. That was travelling all over Asia. And my patch was great. It was from India in the west to New Zealand <laughs> in the east. That was Asia. That was our... So it was great. And it had its advantages. And I saw a huge amount of Asia and, um, and loved it, loved every minute of it. But I was traveling a, a lot, you know. Yeah, so I missed the birth of one of my children, I think, and disappeared to the Iraq war, um, uh, I think four hours after the birth of one of my other children, and then got sent somewhere else. I think, um, when was it? I, I, made a I was gonna tell you the story, but. I got sent to India or Pakistan somewhere, and about a day after. So I, you know, haven't been great on the sort of on, on the husband front. It hasn't really. But she said, "Go, I don't care," which kind of worried me a bit. But, but you know, it's no, it is tough. It can be tough. You have got to make it work. No. No you, you work for both the BBC and IDN. Yeah. Well, What's the best? You've been at ICM quite a long time. Yeah. Um, what is it about ICM News that you think has got the edge of a Hugh Edwards machine? <laughs> <you're> <laughs> well, there's a, there's a difference. What, what's, what do I think? You know, I mean, work wise, for me personally, I mean, I left the BBC when I was uh, a sports correspondent way back in 1986. And I was offered a job at ITN. And part of that kind of job offer was that if you wanted to be a foreign correspondent, this would be the place to do it. And, 
And at the time, and it may still be true, though I don't know, I may be talking out of turn, at the time it just seemed to me that a smaller, more streamlined news organization like ITN would be a better place to maybe get on than a huge operation like the BBC. You know, there are two sides to the argument. Being at the BBC, you do get a chance to do a far broader range of things, you know, within the BBC. So you could, you know, as the guy was saying up there, have a career move maybe within the BBC. But you, but, and at ITN, is, you know, it is basically a news organization. So you are just going to do news. But it just seemed to me at the time when I was, I can't remember how old I was, 27 or 28, and I had the opportunity, and, and I, I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a foreign correspondent, and I, and I thought that the best place to do it would be... And also, ITN's got an incredible reputation and history of covering foreign news and eyewitness reporting, and I, I really admired that, and I really wanted to be part of that. So, so you know, I, made the, I took the plunge, and... You know, there have been opportunities to go back and work for the BBC at different stages of my career, to work for other people, but I haven't felt the desire, real desire to do it. The in most interesting part of my career was when the 24-hour news operation started up, you know, and then and everybody was telling me that that was going to be the future of news. And to a, to a degree, it is the, you know, it has been the future of news, and it is the future now, but... but I still wanted to s spend time going somewhere and, you know, doing, make my own packages and stories and, you know, to, to, to do that. And so I stayed with ITN and, and, you know, I've been very lucky. I don't mind saying I've been very lucky. I've got the jobs that I wanted to get at the time I wanted to get them. And um, so, so that was my personal decision making. But am I saying that the IT, uh, you know, ITV is, is a better news than the BBC or a better place to work than the BBC now. I mean, if you get a chance to go and work at the BBC, trust me, it is one of the world's top organisations, top news organisations, um, and, uh, and will always be, um, and with some fine journalists and brilliant resources. But for me, I just felt that ITN was a place that I wanted to work because of what I'd seen and, and what ITN had done, and still does. Yeah. You've been pretty much everywhere. Is there anywhere you'd still like to go and report? That's a very good question. Um, the Arctic. I went to the Antarctic. Now I'd like to go to the Arctic. Yeah, because <laughs> there's not too many people around. It's quite good. Um, no, I'd like to do that. But I listen. I've been very lucky. I have gone to a lot of places, but um, <coughs> people normally ask me what is the best place I've ever been to. But uh, but look, there are countries. Well, I'd like to go. I'd love to go to Laos, actually. Laos. You know, I never. Got, I was in Asia for seven years. I didn't. Never got. To, got to Cambodia and Vietnam, I mean, but never got to Laos, where I've always wanted to go. But there are, look, I want to see everything in every. You know, I want to go to every country, but you, unfortunately, you don't get that that chance. But trust me, you get a chance to go to enough countries. You get fed up with aeroplanes after a while. You said replacing broadcasters like well, ourselves. It's, it's starting to get really enthusiastic that yeah. we've made very local, local people yeah. in local areas. Sort of but you know, there's this saying that all news is local. So, uh, but I, I know what you're saying, and I think there's, a, there's a, 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 a role for all those. I mean, they talk about city stations as well as regional stations. Um, but you know, we, regional news is a very expensive. It's, people seem to think that it's not expensive or Producing decent journalism doesn't have to be expensive, but it is expensive, and it takes a lot of resources to do well. Um, but I think it, you know, it doesn't matter how local the TV channel is. They've got good people doing decent journalism that provides a service for people locally, then I'm all in favour of it. Well, on a practical level, they got uh, um, more difficult, obviously, because, you know, you, security and what have you. 
And on another level, they got um, far more um, difficult as well because, you know, over the last um, 10, 15 years, it's become very obvious that journalists are seen as, um, as targets. And lots of journalists have been deliberately killed since then because they've been seen to be, in some way, sort of attached to, you know, Western governments or... You know, and, and I think that that is a real, has been a real problem for journalism in general, that where you know, so many journalists are being deliberately um, killed now. Um, and it, it, it has a lot to do with that kind of perception of what journalists are and what they, what they kind of represent. And that has been a real, a real problem for a lot of journalists working in a lot of dangerous areas. The world has become more dangerous for journalists, <coughs> unquestionably. Um, what's the most distressing story that you've covered, and, and how do you get around reporting such a sensitive story? Um, without a doubt, it was Rwanda. Um, I've never seen anything like it, and never will see anything like it again, I hope. But um, it was just the way that... The, the, I mean, I spent a lot of time in a place called Goma, which was, a, which was kind of just an expanse of volcanic rock, really. There was no water, there was no vegetation, there was nothing to eat or anything. And about 15,000 people arrived there on day one because they were chased out of... And within about, I would guess, uh, a week or two, there were over 100,000 people living on this sort of expanse you know, ghastly place, and, and there were, the aid agencies didn't come in straight away. We managed to reach this place because we'd heard what was going on. And there were people, I would say, three to 4,000 people dying a day through no fresh water and no food. And uh, it's the only place I've ever been where I'm doing an interview with a, do a doctor and pe people are dying right there and then you know, as we're doing the interview, and, it, and the, the, so many children were mutilated and killed, and, um, and, and my son had just been born. I think the whole thing was just that I was, you know, it was, it was just an appalling, appalling thing to witness, and I think that was the most distressing thing. And uh, as I say, I hope I don't witness anything like that uh, again. Yeah, a question that's come in by Twitter, actually. Ah. Uh, yeah. wants to know how does the peddling of half-truths on social media that he talked about compare to local papers, under resources <coughs> maybe, publishing press releases uncritically? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really <coughs> important issue. And I, in, 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 um, partly in response to the point about local journalism and that, you know, that, that doing journalism properly is an expensive business and you do need resources and, you know, the, you know, the, there's an increasing temptation to take, you know, press releases, whether on social media or wherever they come, and just stick them in the paper because of the pressure of cost. And you know, in, when I started on my local, when I started on my local paper, there were um, a, there was a desk with about eight reporters around the desk. Then there was a chief reporter and a senior reporter, and about three news editors. And, you know, there are very few local papers, and I mean local papers, have that kind of resource now. And we used to go out and we used to check the stories out ourselves. And, and I can see his point that I do think that the pressure and the cost pressures on what I've said is the mainstream media uh, is raising that issue of, of how rigorous a lot of uh, journalism is today and I think it's very important that that, um, that that you know survives it's a good point it's a very it is a good, very good point but I would say the other point to make sorry is that you know one of the problems with the Twitter is you, it's very difficult to check what we're being told very difficult to check sometimes what you're being told and what you're being shown because quite often people are willfully trying to so you know there's several issues attached to it how many of you sort of set up these countries sort of in the team, like the camera crew and that lot? 
Uh, that's changed as well. It used to be cameraman, sound man, uh, foreign correspondent, reporter, call it what you will, um, producer. Um, when I started, you used to have a lighting man, sort of lighting you up and all that sort of stuff, making you look good. That's all gone. But, um, but now it's quite, quite often you'd go with just a cameraman, um, certainly the reporter. Um, you n normally would have a producer with you. But we've defi definitely scaled down our teams. I mean, quite considerably scaled down our teams. Um, unless you're going to present the news and you get loads of people. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> I wish. No, we get... I, you know, if we're going to present the news somewhere, it would be a cameraman, uh, uh, maybe maximum two cameramen and a producer. <coughs> that, that would, and an engineer to make sure that you know, the dish works and everything. But that would be... That would be maximum for a presenting team. So, you know, the pressures are, the cost pressures are really great, as I'm sure you're aware now. Going back to what you said about the films being targeted um, by friends of uh, abroad, do you think it's worth risking potentially their lives just to get that story? No, I mean, I think, I was just saying to someone else earlier that I think there uh, is no story worth dying for. But there are stories worth risking your life for. And it, uh, that sounds ridiculous, but it, it is quite clear to me that I wouldn't put myself into a situation where I thought there was a you know, high chance that I was going to get killed or the people around me were going to get killed. But we always have to put ourselves in situations where there is a possibility that that could happen. It is a question of gauging the extent of the risk. And even if you take, you know, every precaution that is out there, even if you, you know, you, you've spoken to everybody, you've decided when you go, where you're going to go, and some people have told you it's safe, in a war zone, you never, you never, never know. I've seen so many people um, injured and killed, you know, in situations that they could not have done anything about. And, uh, you know, so... People are, if you go to a war zone, there is a risk that something's going to happen. But it's a question of managing that risk. And um, I was okay because I was a coward, an innate coward. And it tends to kind of limit what you do. But um, you, you, there are various things you can do to try and minimize the risk. I think. We had Jeff Stelling in earlier who yeah. uh, talked about Football. Yeah. preventers on their rolling new shells because of the way they look rather than their actual knowledge. How do you, how do you feel about that? God, get me into real no, trouble now. <laughs> um, no, I was once quoted as saying that, you know, talking about auto cuties and things like this and what have you. Um, my point is very simple, that I think that you should, as I was saying to the, um, the fifth form girl who said, all I want to do is be a presenter, and... I said, well, do you want to be a journalist or a presenter? And she said, well, isn't it the, like the same thing? <laughs> and, I, you know, I, my advice is to go and do some proper journalism and, you know, to get out there and do journalism. Um, but it, it, the, the point is that um, it's the best part of the business. It's the most enjoyable part of the business is to do the journalism and to work as a reporter. Um, and I think, but I mean, Jeff Stelling may have been talking about um, Sky Sports or what have you. But uh, my advice always is to go and do the journalism and learn the journalism. And then if the opportunity comes along to present, um, then become a presenter. But certainly I don't think ITN is uh, <laughs> based on looks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so. Thank you.